everyone and welcome to July office hours and welcome back after we took a month off uh, last month. I hope you have all been having a good summer and all things considered uh, that things are going well for you. It's really, really great to see you all here. Lots of familiar faces. Uh, it's wonderful to have you join us. We have a great topic today. Uh, this is one I think we've been kicking around as an idea for a while and it's come together with a pretty extraordinary panel with a heap of experience. Um, so we're going to be talking about sprints as applied to OER and uh, what's great is we're talking both about textbook sprints and also test Test, test bank sprints. I think I got that right. Um, so talking about the different ways that we can apply this sprint model uh, to creating content um, and moving the needle on, on that uh, very quickly. So I'm very excited to hear from all of our guests. Great to have you join us. And I will now hand over to my co-host Karen, uh, who is here now for the first time, I get to say, representing the Open Education Network. And I believe she has a, a little bit uh, to share uh, about the work that I've been doing there um, before we get started. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Zoe, and thanks everyone at the Rebus community and team. Indeed, we are changing our name this summer from Open Textbook Network to Open Education Network. It is a rolling process, so you will see it start uh, popping up here and there, um, and hopefully Open Education Network will just be saturating the entire environment before the fall begins. Um, but you'll probably see both of our names popping around for a while. So uh, we're always happy to co-host office hours with Rebus. These are monthly sessions. If it's your first time, this is an informal conversation. Our three guests will share about five minutes of their experience with today's topic, textbook sprints. Um, and then we will turn things over to you to drive the conversation with your questions, experiences, and thoughts. So um, speaking of driving the conversation, I'm just going to drop a link in the chat um, for future topics. Uh, you are welcome to stick future topic ideas in the chat, email us, or use this handy dandy form, uh, whichever you prefer, but we are very interested in knowing what it is you would like to talk about. And also feel free to nominate yourself or someone else to be a guest. We really appreciate um, crowdsourcing ideas and uh, we want to have as many voices as possible in these conversations, so it's really helpful to uh, receive suggestions from you. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our three guests and then turn things over to them. We are joined today by Billy Meinke Lau, who is Open Educational Resources Technologist at the University of Hawaii at Manila. We are also joined by Barbara Ruling, who is CEO of Book Sprints Limited. And also we are joined by Anita Walls, Anita is Associate Professor, Assistant Director for Open Education, and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Virginia Tech. We are first going to hear from Billy, so I'm going to turn things over to you now, Billy. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, aloha and good morning, everybody. My name is Billy Mikey Lau, um, and I'm the OER technologist for the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, it's great to be here. Um, this is a, a nice uh, wonderful panel of folks that are all interested in working on um, sprint methodologies um, now towards OER. Um, so at the University of Hawaii, um, we first sort of uh, began working on or looking at what sprints would look like for our OER program about two years ago. Um, and then last year, we um, actually worked with Book Sprints and with Barbara, who you'll, you'll hear from in a moment, um, to conduct uh, two um, fairly extensive book sprints um, across three days apiece, and I will post a link into the chat right now so you can get a little bit more info about um, sort of the outputs of that sprint um, and the process, um, just so you have some background. Um, sprints are awesome. We, we, when I explain what sprints are to faculty, I usually describe it as a hackathon like you would do for code, like software, but for content. Um, and obviously not everything translates over, but we do what we can. Um, to sort of use these accelerated methods and these really highly focused methods um, to sort of pull out the, the best information, the best content from our faculty um, and curate it and then package it into a book. Um, now, like I said, we've done um, a couple different OER textbook sprints. Um, one was an original creation, so a book just over 100 pages, um, an English language um, writing manual. And then the other uh, textbook sprint was a remix of OpenStax microeconomics. Um, and so as you can imagine, uh, writing a book from scratch, we had full choice over how we, 
how we did that, what kind of content we were using. Um, and with the microeconomics book, we already had a whole um, corpus of content to work with. So there are very different approaches, um, but we fit each of them into a three-day period. Um, kind of flashing forward, um, last fall, we did two sprints for ancillary materials. So not for a book, because in each of those courses we were working with, um, they already had a book, but they needed the instructor support materials. Um, so in one case, um, we tackled um, a, a quiz bank for microeconomics um, and localized it, um, replaced names, um, made it more relevant for our students and came up with, uh, I think around 1100 questions, which are available to anybody um, that requests them. Obviously we want you to be an instructor to be requesting them. Um, and then the other was for a world history 1500 to present. Um, that project um, ended up being more of a design sprint. Um, we weren't actually able to pull out um, tangible ancillary materials like you might think of, but we took a lot of notes. Um, we did a lot of listening to figure out what we can do in our next sprint. Um, and I guess just to kind of wrap up, um, sprints are awesome, but they are very intensive. And as, as Barbara and, and you hear later, um, it's, it's a lot of work poured into a very small amount of time. It's, it's not a great fit for everybody. You need to have faculty instructors and students or whoever you want to be participating, um, be very focused, be very committed to the outcome, committed to the process. Um, because there, there are points when it's like, wow, my, my head is racked, like I have writer's block, I can't do anything more. And then we just take a break, we reset, um, trust in the process and we go through. Um, but I'm seeing this as sort of um, OER sprints as an alternative to sort of a traditionally slower pace month by month or semester by semester approach to OER content creation, um, which is nice um, and that works definitely, um, but we need something more just in time. Um, we're looking at OER sprint approaches um, and so yeah, that, that's sort of the gist of it and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from um, Anita and Barbara about their experiences and then taking some questions. Thanks, Billy. Over to you, Barbara. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's great to talk to everybody here. Um, my name is Barbara Ruling. I'm the CEO of Book Sprints, which is um, a tiny little company coming out of New Zealand. Um, our founder, Adam Hyde, came up with this idea for Book Sprints um, more than 10 years ago in the world of uh, open source software. So um, it was the same kind of approach of, you know, how can you get a software manual done very collaboratively and in a short amount of time. And um, since then it has expanded from open source software to any other topic and then also in the last years to um, open textbooks, which is a field that we really love and we think it, it's a really good fit. Um, so the services that we offer are um, mostly the facilitation of book sprints, um, which typically take uh, three to five days, and then also rapid book production services. So um, we facilitate group of experts usually to sprint a book from from scratch, um, like we did with uh, the one book uh, that uh, Billy mentioned. And now we're also experimenting with other um, content formats. So for example, updating um, the OER textbook, um, which was the second book that um, we did with Billy in, for economy. Um, and we're also doing now like sometimes um, sprints for more economy, uh, uh, interactive online courses, um, sort of different types of content containers. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's, we think the sprint format is a really good fit for open textbooks because it's, it goes with our spirit of openness that we, uh, that we love, but also um, because it, it makes a lot of sense to write these very collaboratively, you know, covering a, a very big, um, a broad field and bringing in different perspectives. Um, and and uh, yeah, we've done some uh, textbooks that are, for example, for completely new master programs that haven't existed before and that come together from very many disciplines. And there isn't really the one person who could write the textbook for it, but bringing in people from different disciplines um, and then getting it done quickly. Um, yeah, seems to be a very good uh, fit. Um, like Billy said, they're intense. They're not necessarily less work. They're just a lot of work. Um, in a short amount of time. So um, yeah, what we can do as um, facilitators is making sure that all of the barriers that you know we all know from group meetings, uh, you know, interpersonal dynamics, um, circular conversations, all of that as facilitators, we can sort of get the most of that out of the way and make sure that everybody can be 
as constructive and as productive as they can be. Um, and then having a team in the background doing copy editing, illustrations, book design, all of that simultaneously going on during the same five days. So the writers in the room can constantly check, like, is this actually what we want or do we want something else? Um, so we take a lot of the load off the people's, the writers' shoulders, the experts can really then like focus on, on the content. Um, we did the first um, OER textbook with BC Campus, um, a geography book that was written from scratch. Um, then, yeah, with uh, Billy, we did uh, two last year. Um, we've been doing some textbooks in Germany, some unfortunately less open, some more open, some uh, interactive online courses. And um, we actually had a lot of uh, sprints uh, planned for this year. Um, now with the travel restrictions, some are being postponed. Some we now switch to remote facilitation, um, which is our biggest new adventure. And um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something we're, we're very interested in and we, we hope to yeah, do more in this field. Thank you, Barbara. All right, Anita, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, so my name is Anita Wells. I'm the um, Assistant Director for Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Virginia Tech. And uh, I'm trained as a librarian. I'm not trained as a meeting manager, <laughs> and as, a, as a large event manager, or uh, as a um, instructor who writes questions. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the sprint that um, I led in 2019 for a test bank. Um, I view the sprints in, in having done one as both a hackathon and as sort of a covert professional development opportunity. Um, I'll talk more about that later, but uh, in 2016, I worked with a faculty member to create uh, an open textbook, an adaptation of an open textbook um, that has been really successful. And um, as a result, we've had hundreds of thousands of downloads and we get many emails from people saying, are there slide decks? Are there, can we customize? Is there LMS integration? I'm reading from an actual email. <laughs> Is there a quiz bank? Are there lecture notes? You know, are there recommended in class activities? And initially, I was really annoyed. I was like, you have a textbook. It has an open license. It doesn't cost you anything. Like, please, <laughs> you know, build it yourself. Um, and then I started thinking, well, you're well situated. I'm well situated. I could actually make a big impact if I chose to move forward. And um, and create something. So the big problem in my mind was, I have no idea how to do this. Could I do this? Is it possible? So I knew that um, Rajiv Ajangiani, who's on this call, had done this before. And um, so I reached out and I said, can you tell me a little bit about your experience? Um, what did it cost? How did it work? How did you do this? How long did it take? Um, and he said, well, I can mentor you. <laughs> I, I about cried. So um, thanks to Rajiv for really the model that we tweaked to um, implement the, the, um, the test bank. Um, so I'm sharing some links in the, um, in the um, chat just for various things I'm talking about. Um, what I'm talking about today is based on a presentation that I gave last summer. Um, and um, in this, I talked a, a bit more about what the process looked like. So some of the things that this work required were a lot of goal setting, a bit of money. Uh, we, we spent um, around $7,000 to bring in, um, I'm thinking 12 or 13 people. Um, it required support from my colleagues. Um, there was a lot of work in assessing who are we inviting, what are their areas of expertise, where could they work. Um, this is an 18 chapter book. Um, what topics are they most comfortable in, where are they comfortable enough. Um, so there's a lot of planning before the sprint. During the sprint, uh, we had everyone broken up into groups of three or four to both write and peer review questions. So there's lots of little sprints inside a larger sprint, um, each for about an hour. And people worked in their, on their chapter uh, to write uh, questions that were 
um, factual or applied. They also leveled the questions, so there was a level of difficulty. And then um, they switched after an hour or so. Um, uh, there was a lot of um, pre, there was some pre-reading they did. There's a lot of framing. Why are we doing this? What's the value of this? And um, bringing in outside speakers to talk, Rajiv came in for a few minutes and was actually on sort of on call the whole time. Um, and a few other people came in as guest speakers. The professor who had adapted the book came in and talked about why he adapted the book and um, his rationale behind that. So um, it, it was really fun when I look at 2019, even looking at the whole year, I said, this is the most fun thing that I did all year. Um, it was motivational. It was, yeah, it was intense. It was exhausting, but um, mine was a day and a half, not five days. Maybe that makes a difference, but um, it was a lot of fun. And I am really interested in this model for development and covert professional development. Um, I had adjuncts tell me, I never get invited to anything. Thank you for inviting me. Um, we gave everyone a small stipend. We put them up in a nice hotel. We fed them. We had a nice dinner together one of the nights. And um, I think it was a, a really wonderful way to say your work is valuable. Thank you. And here meet some of your peers. So people really love the opportunity to talk to their counterparts at other institutions, whether they be two or four a year or they be in a different state or um, one person even came in on an, uh, on an iPad <laughs> the, the whole time because he has little kids at home. And um, so it, it was a really wonderful opportunity to involve a really diverse group of people, um, institutionally diverse, diverse in lots of other ways. Um, as a result, we, we have had, um, I'm not talking about the post sprint, uh, maybe I should, but several of you on this call were involved in giving me feedback on building a system so that we would not accidentally give the test bank to students outside of an exam. Um, and um, several of you um, also looked at um, the questions and did some copy editing and told me where all of the missing words were and that sort of thing. So there was quite a lot of work that happened afterwards that I, I honestly did not anticipate. Um, but we have 37 schools at least using the test bank that reflects over 5,000 students per semester. And um, the feedback that I, I received from the team who was involved in doing this grant, which included both faculty and some librarians from other Virginia institutions in, in an effort to give them the opportunity to be exposed to the method and learn and also, um, you know, have the opportunity to see if this is something that they wanted to do. Um, those, um, yeah, the, those, those folks, I think, were really interested um, in this, but the feedback was really good. People said, I want to do the half day first or the first day the whole day first and then a half day. So uh, a small group of us got together for a second sprint to start developing an instructor guide. And we spent most of our time figuring out what, what's going to be in this thing and then started building it. We did not finish. I'm not quite sure how that's going to materialize um, at this point, but um, people are really interested in working together and in continuing. So we'll see what kind of creative solutions we can come up with um, in this time of remote everything. Uh, I think there are possibilities. It becomes different, um, but I think there are good possibilities. So I look forward to hearing your questions. Perhaps there are some in the chat already. So. Thanks, Anita. And uh, thanks to our three official guests for sharing their experience. I'd now like to invite Rajiv, since we've heard about his role with Anita Sprint, to uh, share some more information about his experience. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, it's nice to see everybody and, and hear about these stories. Um, so I'm not gonna retread much ground. I think um, in our experience at KPU, uh, we facilitated sprints in a couple of different areas with faculty, but of course also done a similar thing with students. 
Um, so maybe just to augment what uh, Anita just covered as well, uh, I'd say a few things that are maybe not entirely obvious when you're planning sprints like this with faculty for OER are uh, the sort of nuggets that I'll share. Um, I think Anita touched on the preparation. I think there is, a, of course, a huge difference between having content expertise in a particular area and knowing how to write effective test items. Huge difference, right? So there's training and preparation that's required in general for faculty to learn how to write effective, let's say, multiple choice questions, if that's what you're trying to do. Um, so there's a lot of prep ahead. Uh, but during the sprint itself, I'd say um, if I had to give anybody advice, I would say making it fun and Anita touched on this is one of the most important things. Uh, we did our sprints in a similar way as well. Um, you know, it was really a social aspect that brought a lot of people together, uh, an, almost a retreat style event. Um, but as, aside from the sort of fun activities and the sort of team building, um, I think very deliberately uh, making sure that bringing in sometimes people from outside to make sure that the, the sprinters understand the impact and the value of their work. And I'm saying this because usually I think in, in my experience, uh, the people who are willing to participate in these sort of bite-sized contributions, they're not you know, committing to a year long writing project, it's, it's a few days. Um, they are not necessarily deeply invested in OER. They're not necessarily open textbook authors, for example, right? So they don't necessarily even understand what OER is all about. So for them to get a glimpse of, hold on, this is not just something that our students are going to use at our institution, but I'm hearing from people in Ontario, in, in Virginia, in, in Hawaii about how this work is going to impact them, faculty who are thanking them, uh, you know, testifying that, yes, once you have this, we will adopt it, we will adopt the book. I think giving people a sense of the big picture and the purpose was very, very encouraging. Uh, so those are some of my, I think, top tips. Um, and then I think the, the last bit, uh, last two things I'll mention quickly um, uh, is pragmatically. I think we saw this back in, in 2014 when we did a, a sprint in, in psychology for a test bank that uh, I think Anita put the link for above. Um, you know, when folks, especially those folks, again, who don't necessarily know a lot about OER, um, contribute, right? So their, their own labor, their own sweat is in it. Uh, we found that, you know, of the 20 or so faculty who participated in that sprint, um, you know, 16, 17 of them uh, ended up adopting the book in the year following the sprint. These were not people who were doing OER before, but it's very interesting to see how um, the sort of perception of quality, uh, and of course, when you have your skin in the game yourself, how that translates pragmatically into an adoption uh, uh, pathway. Uh, sort of a, so small participation, whether it's peer reviewing open textbooks or in, the, in this case, sprinting was very effective. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, uh, I think Anita touched on this as well, is unfortunately this project had to necessarily be put on hold for a little while because of, well, everything else in the world going on fire. Uh, but I'm uh, hoping to pick this up now. Uh, we are uh, more than midway through the development of a guide uh, to planning and facilitating um, uh, sprints for developing open ancillary resources. And that's, that's specifically where, where I have a lot more uh, experience than textbooks. Um, and that profiles uh, a bunch of case studies as well. Uh, so I know Anita has contributed to that, folks from BC campus as well. Um, and that of course will be published uh, with the CCBY in Pressbooks. So that you'll hear more about that in the months to come. Thank you, Rajiv, and thanks again to our guests. This is the time when we turn it over to all of you for your questions and comments and thoughts and scenarios. Um, there's already been some activity in the chat. So I'm gonna kick us off uh, with the first question. Both Billy and Anita, you talked about um, quiz banks and uh, alluded to or mentioned, you know, the, the, the reality that you need to limit access to quiz banks to instructors. Can you talk a little bit more about um, how you do that and what kind of overhead is involved? Sure. Um, so the, the quiz bank that we developed for um, OpenStax Microeconomics, our remix version of it, um, we've only had a few requests and they've been internal from our own institution. Um, and so in terms of overhead, it's been quite low. Um, but I think Anita can speak more to this. We've looked at different ways to sort of moderate the flow or the release of these quiz banks. Um, I know if you, if you need to download any kind of um, instructor focused materials from OpenStax, you know, aside the book, um, you have to, um, you know, submit a request and they verify that you're an instructor, you have an .edu email address, that kind of thing. Um, we've looked at that sort of thing. We've also looked at our institutional repository and figuring out how to moderate, um, you know, can we have like uh, password based options um, that aren't available to everybody or how to do that. So 
fortunately for our books, they're available to everybody. We haven't needed to moderate that, but for those more sensitive items as ancillaries, um, we, we, we haven't had too many requests, and so we haven't had to deal with that, but I'm sure Anita can speak to that a little bit more. Sure. Um, so we wanted to make the test bank available to instructors and faculty um, who would hold on to it for students to use in exams. We know at some point it will be compromised and that it will just be out there because somebody will let go of it. Um, but for now, as long as we can, um, we're trying to um, restrict access just to instructors. Um, so we have a verification process where people are, uh, requesters are required to um, indicate which files they want from our DSpace repository, fill out a Google form and send me a copy of their syllabus. <laughs> so we're not trying to make it annoying, um, but I really do want to make sure that I'm not sending a test bank out to students um, because for, for many test banks, they're already out there, whether or not faculty or students know. Um, but if instructors are under the impression that they're not, or they're not checking, or we haven't told them, by the way, this has been compromised, please, you know, tweak your questions and randomize them better. Um, it, it, it's just really an integrity issue. Um, it does take a little bit of time. It took time to build that method. Uh, you can see, at the, the um, let's see, the link that I put in at what time? Um, this last one, I'll put this in again. Um, um, this is the link to the actual interface where you would read about the test bank. Um, you would see the four steps for requesting access. Um, so what happens is I get an email requesting files, then I get a syllabus, then I get a um, notification that somebody completed the Google form. Um, uh, yeah, it's a lot. The systems aren't integrated. It sort of works. It's the best that we can do right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Thank you both. Barbara, you've been talking in the chat about moving the sprint process to the virtual environment. Can you say more about how you're working on that and, and how to make things fun when they're online. Yes, um, that's been our main concern this year. We used to always say it absolutely have to has to happen in person. And um, now we uh, just jumped into the cold water and surprise, it actually does work. Um, we lower the intensity. So in an, on, in an on-site sprint, a day may easily be 12 hours long. Um, so now we make much uh, shorter blocks. Uh, we extend it. Um, it may, for example, be instead of five days, five plus five days or five plus two days, something like that. Um, there's a lot more structure. Uh, and we, uh, we love a facilitation style that's pretty organic, but um, now in the uh, remote facilitation, there's sort of more structure, more handholding in a way. Um, we make sure there's long breaks and that there's sort of like a diversity of formats. So you're not in a Zoom meeting for three hours straight, but there's sort of like switching of, of tasks and, and environments um, yeah, regularly. Um, we start the day with uh, mindfulness exercises, which really helps to bring people into the space. Um, we have social chat channels to uh, have, you know, enough uh, photos of pets and, and kids and everything. We also make sure, I think somebody also asked in the chat, um, we make sure that it's a, a very inclusive environment and, and we make it clear from the beginning that everyone's working from home and it's totally okay that your kids and your dogs and cats are running in and out and, and that's fine. Um, we make a big point of uh, celebrating small and big achievements, um, even more so than we would do in an on-site sprint. Um, and there's lots of little games and so on that you can play. But what we what we uh, see is that people get so motivated. I think uh, a lot of you talked about it, um, Reggie, if you also mentioned it. Um, it's actually very motivating have, having such a big achievement in such a short amount of time, whereas most of us are used to, you know, working uh, on a project for years and we never really see the, the end result. Um, so oftentimes you also just have to get out of the way and let people do the work, you know? So also don't try to make it, um, 
uh, add too many games to it or too many too much play when uh, people actually really really enjoy this intense uh, exchange with their colleagues and and getting deep into the topics that they really care about and um, having enough time to to go into those conversations and, and working on the content um, so it's it's a little bit of a balance of those two you know giving giving enough structure but then also letting go enough so um, so the experts can really work on their topics and uh, yeah it's it's been uh, working it's, it has been a surprise to us but it seems like that's uh, a model that is uh, yeah it's going to stay Thanks, Barbara. And, and related to that, um, how do book sprints or any kind of intensive workshop model adapt to the reality of the pandemic and working remotely? Um, thinking specifically about somebody who may have childcare responsibilities or other responsibilities, I think you spoke to this a little bit, but um, if you can say, it, maybe there's some examples from the virtual workshops you've held so far. Um, how can we think about how people with these responsibilities are still able to participate? Yeah, it's it's a real challenge. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's easier to schedule these because people, you know, are working from home. So in many ways, it's easier to make to find the time. Um, at the same time, it, it is a challenge and we can't get around that. Um, we have the additional issue of uh, time zones. We often have people actually traveling from uh, different parts of the world. And uh, we've had um, one of the virtual book sprints now um, with participants from California all across the US to Central Europe to Finland, which is even an hour off. Uh, so people had, we had to kind of like agree on time blocks where not, not all of the time blocks, everybody had to be there. There were also times when people could sort of work individually, but have enough time as a group. So those were um, crazy hours for both of the extreme ends. Um, so again, I think the only thing that we can really do is make it as accommodating as, as possible and saying it's, it's fine that, you know, like you, you have to take care of your kids and, and, and that's just uh, going to be a reality. Uh, making the breaks long enough, trying to discuss as much uh, as possible beforehand sort of what people's availabilities are and where they can already see um, where it's going to be challenging. Um, but it's so important in these sprints to have everybody together. You really need kind of the dynamic. There's so much exchange going on. People depend so much on each other in the, in the writing and in the peer reviewing. Um, but often, yeah, we, we, we find that people actually uh, get more and more committed the more they get into it. So in the beginning, there may be sort of like more um, people being careful about how much they can uh, commit and how much time they can um, uh, free up. And then as they get into it, they get so motivated by this sort of, um, by this big goal um, that somehow um, they can make it work. But for sure, it's, it's something, even for us as facilitators, it's not something that you can do every week or not even every month. It's um, like Anita said, no, it's like the, the most fun thing you do in a year. So maybe it's like, it's, it's one, of, one of a kind um, um, experiences and then you, you try to find the time for it. Thanks, Barbara. I think we're all very interested in how to try and translate the sprints experience into our new environment. Um, there's been a few more follow-up questions in the chat. And of course, anyone's invited to um, contribute their ideas or weigh in or brainstorm. Um, but just uh, Rajiv is wondering about virtual sprints that allow for a combination of synchronous and asynchronous sessions. So how to sort of keep that, um, that important togetherness time yet, like you said, Barbara, not have a three hour Zoom session where everyone starts wilting. Um, and then Anita has a question about managing communication during a virtual sprint um, and, and how that's done uh, between small groups, large groups and people individually. Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, the synchronous and asynchronous times is um, something that we try to mix up. Uh, the, in the beginning, it's very important to have synchronous times and to really get everybody on board and, and make sure that everybody shares the same vision and, and works towards the same goal. And then from then on, you can have more asynchronous time blocks um, and make sure you have enough check-in times where the group comes back together, but that can be half an hour or something like that. And then people can adjust sort of when, when they work according to the time zone. Um, the communication is, uh, I mean, we have, we work with, I think, five different tools during a sprint. 
which is not ideal, but it's uh, what's happening right now. So we usually use uh, Zoom, for example, in breakout rooms. Um, sometimes work with Google Meet, which has the advantage that you can open uh, many rooms at the same time. So actually participants can switch rooms on their own. They don't need the host uh, to allow them to switch. So depending on what kind of sprint it is, you may want that control or, or you may want to give up that control to the participants. So you can actually also be in two rooms at the same time. Um, we use uh, Mattermost or Slack. Um, so there's also a chat going on at the same time. Um, then, yeah, some kind of um, uh, online writing tool where people write collaboratively so they can also leave comments in the text direct directly. We use um, Miro or Mural for the brainstorming sessions. And then we also have kind of like a record of decisions that were taken um, and visualized there. Um, did I leave anything out? I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's even more. <laughs> I'm sure there's also the one or the other email that creeps in. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we uh, try to make sure sort of, for example, in, in Slack or in Mattermost, which is just an open source version of, of Slack, um, if you have different parts of the book, for example, for each chapter, you have uh, one channel, you have one um, uh, um, Google Meet room or one uh, room and uh, one, for example, Google Doc or some kind of like a, a writing tool and then make sure the links are all somewhere. So whenever it's look, one person's looking for somebody else, they can sort of choose like, okay, I want to go and find this group. And, um, and then we have very set times where everybody comes back together in the, in the plenary group uh, to discuss together. And then there's also times, of course, when people can work individually. Thanks. That's a lot of tools to wrangle. Um, but I can see how they each enable a very specific scene. Billy, you mentioned that your follow-up and post-production work is done virtually and uh, mostly asynchronously. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. So for both of the full-scale book projects, um, you know, we had three-day intensive periods working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And by the end of the day, everyone was like, wow, okay, I'm definitely done. I can't do any more. Um, and even at the end of the three days, folks weren't able to do um, much more. And so we set two deadlines. One was an initial one week period where everyone gets to kind of decompress, um, do something else for a while, come back to it. And then we all met synchronously um, to share notes and take feedback. And then we set one more date. It was two or three weeks out, again, working asynchronously to make final revisions and edits and suggestions that we all got together and met synchronously um, to decide on which, when, which things are going to make it into the first version of the book. Um, and so um, even though we had three days in person, um, there was probably not the same number of hours committed for each person, but a, a fair amount of work afterwards um, that folks did independently. Um, we had folks for the English book, I think it was folks from seven different campuses. So this is a, a UH system wide project. And these folks, um, only one or two, only two of them, I think, were at the same campus or even, you know, they, t they teach at different campuses. Um, but basically, these folks had not worked together before and they weren't going to work together again immediately afterwards. And so the idea of doing things um, virtually at a distance was not a big deal. It really came down to um, having those, the shared agreement on, you know, when we were going to meet and what was going to be done by then. Um, and, and the small details obviously mean a lot. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is that um, requiring everyone to be in the room for three days solid back to back to back, um, that eliminated some folks who had um, prior obligations or they were teaching, um, you know, they, they couldn't do it. Um, and so the traditional sprint method we used last year eliminated some folks, um, but moving to a virtual sprint, which we, we are exploring right now, um, actually opens the door for more, more folks. Um, while at the same time presents some more technical challenges, which may make it a little more difficult for certain folks um, to be involved. So it's, um, as things shift, um, we definitely want to keep doing sprints, um, but doing it virtually, you know, the, the things that Barbara mentioned are, are super key and book sprints have done a really good job working through like how that might work. Um, because having the outside facilitation, um, we found versus our internally done sprints, um, it was a different sort of approach. Um, it's hard to describe but having accountability um, to an outside party um, was different than having accountability internally. Um, and this is something we should explore some more, um, but there, there are different models. Um, and I'm really eager to hear some more, more questions and find out how folks think this could work virtually wherever they are. Likewise. 
Uh, thanks, Billy. So this is a great time to brainstorm. Cheryl's trying to think about if there's a way to uh, have a sprint and still maintain social distancing, particularly for groups of people who don't have to get on a plane. Um, and sort of related to whether it's virtual or in person, I'm um, interested in hearing about, you know, kind of the, the kickoff. You know, you, you're getting a group of people in a room, whether it's a Zoom room or a conference room, you know, what are sort of the, some of the first activities? Does this group of people know each other? Kind of how is the, the trust built um, amongst the group is another thing. Um, let's talk about. I can, I can start. Um, yeah, the, I think the kickoff is, is crucial and even more so in the virtual sprints, I think, than on site because there's a little bit more time to get to know each other and, you know, read each other's body language and so on. There's sort of like a little bit more um, natural trust established. Um, for us, the, the even more important than some kind of like icebreaker game and, and introducing each other and so on is, um, creating the sense of shared ownership. And uh, we achieve that by giving everybody the, the opportunity to really speak out about what matters for them. Like why are they part of this um, and what do they try to get out of it? So it's, um, it's a lot more than saying sort of like here, uh, you're here because you're an expert on, on X, Y, and Z and here's your task and you should be writing this uh, chapter and then it becomes kind of like, you know, like a, a top-down uh, structure and then people get into the mode of a, you know, a nine to five job. Um, but when you make sure that everybody gets to speak out and, and create this vision together and, and also allowing yourself to be surprised about what may come up, no? The people who are actually working with the students and on the ground may have um, uh, actually different challenges than, than the organizer has envisioned, no? And there may be some, some incredible insights coming up and, and incredible new ideas. Um, that gets everybody so motivated then coming up with that shared vision and then deciding like, okay, this is what we actually need to focus on and this is what the scope of the work should be. And um, uh, that can all be done in the first two hours or so. Um, and um, yeah, I think that, that for us is the most important kickoff point. I would agree that that's, that's critical to the success of the project is that people trust each other and they feel like they can contribute from their area of strength and that they're welcome there. Um, I made that very clear. I know that when you work so closely together with people, um, you will have professional disagreements, you may have personal disagreements, you may really not like someone. And so I know Billy um, said that um, Barbara helped develop a code of conduct, but I, I told people um, if there's a conflict that you cannot resolve and want to know about it. Um, and um, I, I, it's, it's really important that this is a respect, a place of respect for one another. And um, so we weren't really detailed in that, but I think setting the tone for, you are welcome here, we're happy and excited you're here. This is a, a place where you can bring um, your, um, the, the things that you care about. Um, so I, I think this is a really important way of starting uh, any kind of group activity. Okay. Um, there's also been some discussion in the chat about numbers, uh, particularly what participants are paid. So it sounds like Anita, the stipend uh, for your program was 250 plus um, plus an experience really of, of hotel and travel and eating and um, that that appealed to people and turned out to be, like you said, a covert professional development experience. Um, thinking now about you know, the, the test bank experience and, and doing this sprint for um, an ancillary material like that, is there sort of a feedback method that you have in place for um, receiving feedback on test banks from those who've adopted them? That's a really good question. Um, I have all their contact information. There is not a feedback mechanism right now. There is for our, our other books, but that is something that I, um, I do want to ask for. I ask internally and in a very informal method. 
um, you know, what, what's your experience been? Have you used questions from it? What have you done with them? Have you modified them? Um, do you feel like they're assessing well the, the things that you need assessed? These are multiple choice questions. They should not be the only assessment in your course. <laughs> um, I don't have control over that. Um, but, you know, are, are they helpful? Um, do they get you a step closer to um, being able to adopt something that um, doesn't cost your students anything that you could customize? Um, so that's a good question. I'll have to get back with you once I do something about that. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. Uh, Regina has a question in the chat. So thinking about <clears throat> who's participating in these sprints, how do you identify and select participants? How do you center diversity in your choice of participants? For example, intentionally asking people of color faculty to participate, adjuncts or non-tenure track faculty. Um, I can address that. We had a list of people who had had inquired about the book. Um, we started there with people that we knew might be interested. Um, we were really geographically limited because we we could not pay for people to fly in. Um, and we were only paying up to a certain amount of money for transportation. We just felt like it was not a good use of money to bring in somebody from really far away that would cost three times the amount of local people that, that might um, be able to come and might form a network that um, continues. So um, we, we looked at, it was important to me to include um, people from two-year institutions. I'm at an R1 and sometimes um, R1s um, are not the, most friendly to community college instructors, but I think the community college instructors are committed to learning and um, it's critical to include um, two-year instructors, to include adjuncts, to include people who are coming out of a um, professional background and into higher ed. They bring such a rich, um, they bring such a, a diversity of how to ask, what to ask, how to approach things, how to deal with people. They're not as embedded in the academic um, structures as we have. Um, as far as um, race, gender, um, honestly, it was trying to identify who's teaching this, who could come. We invited lots and lots of people. Um, we had some people of color come, which I was thrilled about. We talked a lot about um, names in the questions. Are you including names that represent your group of students? Um, are you including names in your questions that represent um, people who are underrepresented? Like, please include, <laughs> please include these students in the questions that you're writing. Um, is it perfect? No. Could we do more? Yes. Were we lucky to get the people that we got and on the, the notice that we had? Um, it's kind of a big ask to um, even ask people, can you come for two and a half or three days? We did this in January. Uh, it was right before school started. That's a crunch time. Um, there's no really good time to do this, <laughs> um, but just getting people there uh, I think generally was a challenge. Um, the recruiting was a lot of, um, you know, it was a lot of work to, to get people there who were qualified and who um, were interested and who could, you know, make the drive. Some people drove from, you know, drove eight hours to be there. Other people drove five. Um, some people were local. Um, that's a, it's a big ask. Um, in time. So, um, yeah, I love suggestions <laughs> on how to do that better. Um, I'd like to do that better. I'd love more suggestions if you have them. Thanks, Anita, for describing your recruitment experience. Billy, Barbara, any thoughts on ensuring a diverse group of participants? 
Um, I'll just mention um, that for our two book sprints, um, the, the constraints that we were working within, you know, nine to nine, three days straight, sort of on its own, um, eliminated participation from a number of folks, and that was unfortunate. Um, and then when you get down to um, sort of the way um, stipends and travel is handled at each campus, that eliminated some folks too because their department or their, their unit wasn't able to process things fast enough. So we definitely, um, you know, Hawaii is a fairly diverse state. Um, we love to see representation, you know, across all folks, um, but at the same time, um, the reality of who was actually able to make it for the in-person sprints um, sort of reduced the larger group that we, we might have had to a much smaller group, which remained diverse, but it wasn't um, maybe as diverse as it could have been. Um, that said, it's something that we definitely need to be intentional about. And now that we're doing, we're looking at doing these things remotely, um, by all means, we definitely should be doing that and making sure that more groups are represented and it's not just, um, you know, the, the same folks over and over again. Um, the other thing to mention is that most of the folks that participated were non-tenure track instructors. And so we didn't actually have as much interest from tenure seeking faculty. Um, uh, you know, when you're putting together your, your dossier, you're trying to, you know, build a case for, for gaining tenure and not all departments and, and, and folks recognize this kind of work as being as impactful as giving a big grant or publishing in a high impact journal or, or your manuscript or whatever that may be. Um, and so that on its own sort of uh, whittle down the folks that might be interested into who can actually commit the time when they have these other things they need to be spending their time on. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, I think, uh, Billy, you actually did a phenomenal job with putting together a great group of, of uh, writers and, and quite a diverse one. I can't tell you in how many companies we make book sprints and we have uh, uh, 15 uh, uh, white male wasps sitting in the group, uh, happens all the time. Um, we always advise uh, people who organize a sprint to get, um, of course you're limited also by, you know, like the people who are in the area of ex expertise who can actually make it, but a more diverse group is actually usually a better group. Um, there's, there's very good reasons apart from, you know, uh, ethical reasons uh, why you want to go that way. Um, we also always advise bringing in people, not just sort of from the highest ranking levels, um, but having um, people who work sort of more on the ground, on the ground, so to speak, and, um, and commitment goes over um, sort of achievements, we would say. So somebody who's uh, committed and who's maybe uh, more at the start of the career, maybe a, a great participant. Um, we even encourage having uh, what we call the target readers represented. So a student um, or maybe uh, somebody who uh, just finished a master or a PhD candidate or something like that. Uh, so whoever you, you imagine who's going to be consuming uh, what you're producing, um, that can be really great having somebody, um, at least one or two people on the team who can ask all the right questions, uh, make sure there's no jargon. And, and we like to give um, them a lot of power actually in, in the room. So um, yeah, diversity is, is a big topic um, and it's, it's still something to be worked on a lot, I think. Um, I think it's interesting oh, sorry, go ahead, Rajiv. Oh, no, sorry. Um, I was only going to chime in with, with one other kind of thought. I think it's, it's such a delicate balance, uh, I think, especially when so much of work in open education more generally, and Sprint certainly is no exception, is, um, is undercompensated. There's so much invisible labor. Uh, and again, if you're talking about riskier academic work that is less likely to be recognized uh, when it comes to tenure and promotion and those kinds of things, you're often, you know, with the intention of seeking to be more equitable and be more inclusive, asking folks who are most marginalized to take on the most professional risk in participating in these initiatives. So I think, you know, there's a number of structural things that are helpful, uh, including sort of having that balance of, uh, you know, tenured folks in the room, uh, making sure there's some uh, effort to, to make sure there's recognition of the work that's been secured that will follow uh, to acknowledge that work in people's portfolios, perhaps after. And perhaps even I would suggest looking at a, a model of compensation if you're talking about stipends or honoraria, which is calibrated. So for example, if you're talking about adjunct faculty, any kind of professional development is something that if they're engaging on it is on their time, on their, on their dime. So I would suggest that calibrating up the stipends for adjunct faculty, uh, for early career faculty is, is a very sensible option, uh, particularly when those who are more privileged 
have the privilege of being able to forego income from commercial uh, enterprises that, that they're choosing not to engage in. So a couple of thoughts. Thanks. Zoe, did you want to chime in? I was uh, just going to uh, echo and, and um, highlight the comment from Anita in the chat about where uh, virtual events can at least address some of the, the structural barriers that are faced, uh, those with you know, more, um, more care duties. Uh, the, so the scheduling can be a little different. I think it's interesting that there's some space there to make that work in favor of ensuring that there are more, uh, that these events are more inclusive. Um, and have my more diverse representation uh, in how they go. I, I kind of, you know, we're approaching time, but I hope that that's something that we can really move forward here and be explicit as we are starting to think through and create new guides and, and, and create new models for how to do this with a different, uh, a different approach and what's necessary right now that we can also really explicitly embed that in there, recognize the challenges that have already been found with the in-person events um, and, and find ways to, to be really deliberate about addressing them as much as, as is possible. Uh, but I, I really, really echo what uh, Rajiv said there. There's a lot more to, to it than just scheduling. You know, um, there's a, 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 a lot more, uh, there's a lot more to think through and, and, and a lot of intersecting kind of structures that are, that are uh, creating these challenges. Okay, well, as Zoe mentioned, we are quickly approaching time within seconds. Uh, thank you everybody for a rich conversation exploring sprints, both in the world we used to know in person and in our current world virtually. Um, I think there's a lot more here we can explore. We didn't even talk very much about students involved in the process, um, which would be a really fun conversation. So, um, if you are thinking about hosting a virtual sprint, um, you know, let people know in the chat before we end this call or in the Rebus community or in the OTN community, um, and we can support one another as we try to figure out um, how to support this process virtually. So please join me in thanking our guests, Billy, Barbara, and Anita, and in thanking uh, one another, all of you, for contributing your questions and reflections and thoughts to this conversation. As always, it's a pleasure and look forward to seeing you all again next month. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you.